Warning, the following podcast contains adult language. I don't know how old the language is, but it's definitely old enough to cuss. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by the new nighttime sedative made especially for Christian politicians, the My Sleeping Pillow. How do you sleep at night? The My Sleeping Pillow. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, this is the Left of the Valley crew. My name is Kevin. My name is Nancy. I'm Christina. And I'm Kirsten. And we definitely evolved from filthy... And we definitely evolved from filthy, hairy men. Monkeys. No, no, monkeys. Do it again. Filthy, hairy monkeys. Filthy monkey men. Filthy monkeys. Jeez. It's filthy what? Monkey. Monkey men. Oh, God. And we definitely evolved from filthy monkey men. Yeah, because look at Kevin's hairy chest. Yeah, he's practically half ape already. Hey, I'm right here. It's August 29th. And it's International Day Against Nuclear Tests. But, uh, are we going to stop all these hurricanes? <laughs> yeah, I got one coming <laughs> right at me. I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm um, Heath Enright. And from Sorceress Christine O'Donnell's New Jersey. Damn right. <laughs> Cincinnati Swing State and Good Husband Georgia. This scathing atheist. On oh, this week's episode, New Zealand will shoot yet another arrow through our heart. The My Pillow Guy finally gets recognized for his contribution to the intellectual progress of humanity. And Heath will not even make it this far into the show without being so embarrassed that he's in New Jersey that he lies to you about it. <laughs> but first, since uh, the giant drive, <laughs> I tried to make a lie. Imagine you bought a used car. And for the purposes of this example, let's say that you don't know a hell of a lot about cars going in, but you researched it a bit online and you're pretty sure you got a good deal on this make and model. So you buy your used car, you you drive it around for a week and you hear this weird knocking in the engine. So you take it to the nearest mechanic and the mechanic tells you you got ripped off. She says this car's falling apart. Every major system is on the brink of failing and it's being held together with chewing gum and chicken wire. But you're an inherently suspicious person and you just don't want to take somebody's word for it. So you decide to get a second opinion. So you take that car back to the used car dealer that you bought it from in the first place. And you say, hey, can you look at this thing and make sure you didn't rip me off? And and so he looks at it and he, and he comes back and he says with the utmost of sincerity that, no, he didn't rip you off at all. So you drive away satisfied. The knocking persists. You don't trust that first mechanic anymore. So you take it to a different mechanic, and he tells you the same thing that the first one did. So you take it back to the used car dealer again, and you say, hey, man, are you entirely sure that you didn't rip me off? But he takes another look at the car and once again affirms with 100% certainty that he did not rip you off and that the car will be fine for years and years to come. And you're a little suspicious at this point, so you point to some of the chewing gum and the chicken wire that these mechanics keep showing you. But he explains that all away with a bunch of phrases that, you know, they don't entirely make sense to you. Remember, in this example, you don't know a hell of a lot about cars, but you do know that these are all legitimate car words. And if you understood more, this would all make sense. So you drive away again. Fast forward a couple of weeks. The car's broken down altogether. It doesn't run. It doesn't idle. And one of the doors fell off. So you tow it back up to the used car salesman. You tell him that you're pretty darn sure he ripped you off. But once again, he gives his utmost solemn oath that there's nothing at all wrong with the car. You're probably just flooding the engine when you try to start it or something. And when you think about it, the point of having a car was never that it was going to start anyway. So he sends you away again. You tow your car back home, patting yourself on the back for thwarting all those dumbass mechanics that tried to lie to you and tell you there was something wrong with your car. Isn't it amazing how obviously stupid you are in this story if we switch out religion for anything else? So this analogy occurred to me the other day as I was perusing one of the many Facebook atheist pages that I frequent. I saw a listener recounting his deconversion, and it was almost exactly this story. He kept being presented with the atheist arguments via books, YouTube videos, and friends. And then he kept taking all of those arguments, 
back to his pastor, back to the same guy that sold him this defective worldview in the first place. Now, to be fair to the listener in question and to the many people who have similar origin stories in atheism, the analogy breaks down in a couple of important places. So the poor victim of religious indoctrination doesn't have to kick themselves the way that our hapless second person car buyer did. If we wanted to make it accurate, we'd have to add in a whole bunch of that dealer's other customers towing around their cars that didn't run and insisting there was nothing wrong with them. We'd have to add auto magazines that argued that cars were never meant to run in the first place. We'd have to assume that you bought this car as a child and it's definitely the make and model your dad recommended. We'd have to assume that trade schools had special classes for mechanics that wanted to work on cars that didn't run and never would. But the basic issue still holds. Right. When religious people are given challenges to their religion, they invariably take them back to their pastor or their imam or their priest or their bishop or their rabbi or whatever. And they say, are you entirely sure you're not ripping me off? They'd feel like idiots immediately if they did that with any other product or service. But when it comes to religion, people don't seem to realize that they're just asking the salesman to sign off on his own work. And yes, they're paid on a commission Right. And, and that's the real place that the analogy breaks down. See, at least the used car salesman would be honest about the profit motive. Right. They'll tell you stuff like, I want to sell you a car. They'll ask, what's it going to take to get you to drive away in this car? They'll make it super clear what they're there to do. Religious leaders will fucking lie about that. You know, they're there to sell you something just like the used car salesman. Their job requires that they sell a certain number of units to keep the lights on. And yet they will never be honest enough to say, what's it going to take for me to get you into this pew? Right. They pretend that they really just have your best interests in mind. They're really just worried about you and your immortal soul. And thus, whenever they make a sale of their non-existent product, it's dishonesty squared. And that's the group that we're dealing with. An entire profession subsidized by the government more so than any other that can only aspire to achieving the level of honesty that we'd expect from used car salesmen. And even though they could aspire to it. They don't. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Daryl and Daryl to my Larry, Heath Enright, and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, <laughs> are you ready to explain to most of the listeners what the hell I'm even referencing at this point? <laughs> Deep into the old TV right there. And I think we're all about to wake up from a nightmare spooning Bob Newhart. What that means. <laughs> Spoiler. It's be great. Spoiler. Uh, yeah. uh, for, for our <laughs> listeners under the age of 85, Bing Crosby beat his wife and children. That's all I need to <laughs> Okay. You have a lot of weird Apropos details of like nothing. that. Yeah. A lot yeah. of important <laughs> notes. Give you that note. Okay. In our lead story tonight, according to a recent study about the difference between real news and satire, Christian Republicans are super bad at identifying things that are true. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And a study conducted just now about the meaning of Christian and Republican backed up the original study. <laughs> so in case it wasn't already obvious, idiots of all different groups are sharing headlines that aren't real. But America's Christian right is mathematically extra, extra, super duper, extra wrong when they do that sort of stuff. They sure right. Are right. Yeah. To be clear, group. that's they're extra wrong when you subtract out the extra wrongness that comes into it with the them being demographically defined through their religion and power. God, it's actually, it's difficult to explain <laughs> how wrong American Christians are. That's, that's literally true. <laughs> so the study was conducted by a team at Ohio State University to see how well different groups of Americans were able to tell the difference between a real piece of journalism and satire from a site like The Onion. And it turns out there's a site called The Babylon Bee, which is basically the Christian onion. And the existence of the Babylon Bee accidentally created a perfect case study on the terrifying stupidity of their target audience. And apparently a bunch of them think all those headlines are real. Like a, a, so much. So Very many, many. So many it's too many. Way Very too many. many. It's terrifying. So the Babylon Bee got some attention recently thanks to a big argument they had with Snopes. The Bee published a satirical article based on a real story involving Georgia State Representative Erica Thomas. In reality, Thomas was in the 
10 items or less lane at the grocery store. And some guy started harassing her for having more like 15 items. Just for the record, she was almost nine months pregnant at this point. Oh, wow. <laughs> rules are rules. Detail. Yeah. And some guy said rules are rules and then possibly started saying slur type stuff, but at least mean type stuff. Anyway, after the incident, Thomas, who happens to be African-American, put a video on Twitter that accused this guy of using the phrase, go back to your country. But the store reviewed the security tape, and it turns out the guy actually just yelled other offensive stuff, but not specifically that phrase. Exonerated. Got it. Got it. Should have gotten into Harvard. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> turns out he had like a Cuban person in his ancestry somewhere oh, far well, back, so go. he couldn't have been racist. Yeah. yeah. So he was Marco Rubio. We should have told you this at the beginning. It makes a lot more sense. <laughs> it was not Marco Rubio. That would have been amazing. Marco Bethesda Rubio. So, <laughs> so anyway, it turns out this guy didn't specifically say, go back to your country. Uh, so Thomas had to walk back her statement. And here's the headline we got from the Babylon Bee surrounding that real headline. Quote, Georgia lawmaker claims Chick-fil-A employee told her to go back to her country, later clarifies he actually said, my pleasure, end quote. Which, I mean, like, yeah, that's kind of funny. It's kind of funny, but not at all a real headline, obviously. But this got shared by way too many idiots with comments that clearly indicated they thought it was a real story. So it eventually got onto the Snopes radar, and they explained to the internet how the internet works, and they also added a little bit of scolding for the Babylon Bee that basically said, hey, if your audience is super dumb, and they are, you should <laughs> probably make it a bit more clear that your story is a joke. Well, but yeah, I mean, but Christian humor sites can't exactly rely on being funny the way The Onion can. That's how you know The Onion <laughs> yeah. is satire because it's funny. Or honestly being satire. You well, know, that's it. Yeah, right. it's very tricky. Getting back to the study from Ohio State. They found that when satire has a political leaning similar to your own, you're way more likely to think it's real. Makes sense. So Democrats were way more likely to think headlines from The Onion were real compared to Republicans. But when it came to the Babylon Bee and its conservative Christian theme, Republicans were way, way, way more likely to fuck it up than Democrats. Like double the amount of fuck it up and double the amount of stupid and sharing it and thinking it's real. One quick example People were presented with an article from The B with the headline, Ilan Omar says, if Israel is so innocent, then why do they insist on being Jews? <laughs> okay, now that, that's actually funny. <laughs> and the article also includes another fake quote from Omar, where she says, they want people to feel sorry for them, but they're just out there every day being Jews. It's almost <laughs> like they're taunting everyone. So... <laughs> You guys ready for a terrifying number? Yeah. About the the amount of people that thought that was real? Oh, no. Yeah. The study found that 23% of Republicans <laughs> oh. thought that article was, quote, definitely true. Oh. Also, 8% of Democrats, which is oh, wow. fucking terrifying also. I will. I mean, to be fair, they are being Jews, though. Like, yeah. That part. That's Honestly, true. Parts I'm surprised 23% of the people who stuck with grabbing by the pussy guy can read. So I yeah. don't think that's. <laughs> so the point here isn't about Snopes having a snippy tone when they're debunking obvious satire. It's about how the Bible is a giant onion or Babylon B article that three quarters <laughs> of the United States uses as the basis of their worldview. And that means way too many Americans think. Typed words are a credible source, assuming it agrees with their existing opinion. So here we are in a post-truth universe where Hillary Clinton fucks kids in a pizza dungeon, which is way more plausible than the Bible. Way more, That's yeah. physically possible. Yeah, we're like three months away from finding out how many kids her husband fucked with Jeffrey Epstein. So like, you don't even need to switch last names to be talking about real <laughs> shit. Uh, it's gonna be... I believe that case got dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> And in a bets of bet news tonight, regular listeners to the show may remember that we recently praised New Zealand for their public and open mistrust of evangelical Christians. Well, this week they doubled down on winning our love forever when a Kiwi man threatened to shoot his flat earther friend with a crossbow 
when he proved how fucking stupid he was. <laughs> this is the best. Oh, New Zealand, we love you so much. New Zealand, land of Rivendell and skepticism and apparently Wookiee fights. Our three favorite things. <laughs> and those are absolutely Crossbow three. Crossbow attacks. Fuck raindrops and roses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So here's the story. According to the Otago Daily Times, hero and handsome man who is handsome, Jamie Matthew <laughs> Sutherland was having dinner with his old school friend, Louis Lance. Well, it turns out Louis dedicated himself full time to being an asshole and bet Jamie 10,000 New Zealand dollars or three American dollars that the world <laughs> was flat. So presumably Jamie then sent Louis some evidence that the world wasn't fucking flat because Louis later posted on Facebook that he did, in fact, now believe the world was a sphere. It, OK, oh. let me guess. He he sent him mass that doesn't fall diagonally <laughs> he would not return our request for comments so i don't i don't know <laughs> however that's not how mr also, lands it's not a sphere dude <laughs> yeah. also that's not how mr lands tells it according to mr lands jamie approached him at a gas station about a week later demanded his ten thousand dollars and threatened to murder him and his father with a crossbow if he didn't pay up <laughs> so 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 Louis Lands then goes to the cops. This ends up in court where despite the fact that Jamie doesn't even own a crossbow, a judge like officially and legally called the bet off and I guess also the proposed murder. <laughs> okay. That, that's a weird legal system. Murders have to get called off by a judge. <laughs> Uh, also, fuck you. The bet still counts. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. Yes, Everything about that judge's decision is weird to me. And look, there's some good unbiased takes on this story. We got it from Hammett Meta over at the Friendly Atheist blog. He did a great job. The original story that he linked does a good job. But I'd like to take a moment, dear listener, to tell you what really happened. Because if I'm an expert in anything, it's arguing with dishonest morons. I have a doctorate in arguing with dishonest morons. I feel like you'd have nailed the spelling on that sentence if that was true. But, but for the purposes of this setup, yes. Okay. You have a, Thank you. A doctorate. Thank There's you. just a really big cluster of spelling There's mistakes right here. The little here. squiggly right guy right was there. But anyways, when my body is dust and the aliens roam our planet looking for archaeological signs of our civilization's existence, they stumble across me in any way, shape, or form. It will, in all likelihood, be me arguing with dishonest morons. <laughs> All right, kids, as you can see, this fossil here is doing a face palm and giving the middle finger with the other hand. This is called the Cenozoic Holocene Atheist Podcaster. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so here's what really happened. All right. Jamie and Louie run into each other. Louie doesn't have any friends anymore because he's an ignorant piece of shit. So Jamie does that weird like frozen. The guy keeps saying days and you, you run out of excuses things. So he agrees to hang out with him and have lunch because <laughs> he feels bad if he says no. So during that hangout, Louis is just like so monumentally proudly ignorant that when he finally gets around to just outright denying the shape of the fucking planet, <laughs> Jamie calls him out and is like, hey, you know what? Ten thousand dollars if I prove you wrong. <laughs> Jamie just pushes over Louis's chair, takes the money off the table. Hey, look, you fell downward from gravity. Thanks for the ten grand. Bye. <laughs> Right. So over the next couple of days, I bet you here's what happened. Louis sends like YouTube videos from Truth Seeker 420 Blunt 69, which Jamie like does a bunch of Wikipedia to debunk until Louis, pouting and filled with the realization that he would have been better off ground up into food for starving kids, goes radio silent. <laughs> or he was pretending he'd fallen off the edge. That's yep, yeah, that's possible. So then at the gas station, Jamie like sees Louie and he's like, hey, you owe me $10,000. You better pay up. Wink, wink. But see, Louie is like all conspiracy theorists, a, a stupid, self-centered, concerned piece of shit. So he immediately calls the cops and pretends he received death threats because he's so self-centered and detached from truth as a concept that literally anything that feeds into victimized special one worldview becomes the perfect omnipresent word of God. Yeah, the god of the universe who got outsmarted by some atheists who routed all the flights from South America to Australia via Dubai to hide the truth. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So then Jamie, who's just fucking joking, he gets dragged in front of a fucking judge where he has to like say with a straight face that no, he doesn't expect $10,000 from or plan to murder the worthless 
human being standing to his right in the only suit he'll ever own and be buried in. Stop <laughs> so, Jamie's like, okay, does it count if I only just now started planning to murder him? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's valid. So, Jamie, if you're listening, and we know you are, big fan, from one warrior to another, take my advice. Delete Facebook, my dude. <laughs> in the words of future President Tim Ryan, nobody's coming to save us. <laughs> It's going to be a sweaty four years. All right. <laughs> well, Eli just called himself a warrior, so I think we need a minute to remind him of him. So we're going to take a quick break and hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucid. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massachusetts. If I were to ask you, what's the appropriate punishment for sexual assault, you would probably immediately assume I meant for the perpetrator. And apparently that's because you don't run Fayette County High School in Fayetteville, Georgia. So here's one of the more disgusting stories I've come across in a while. It's about a lawsuit filed by a young woman who goes by the initials AP in the court filings. According to the lawsuit, AP was staying after school one day and met with a boy. They flirt, they kiss, and then the boy asks her for oral sex. She says no. He asks harder. When she tries to leave, he grabs her by the throat, pushes her against the wall, and threatens her. So she performs oral sex on him, gets the fuck out of there, and reports that she was sexually assaulted. Already a pretty horrible story, but you already know what's coming, don't you? I mean, there's no video of the incident, so what, the principal is just supposed to take her word for it? And sure, that's a rhetorical question, but not in the direction that FCHS assistant principal Brandy Johnson thought. According to AP, at one point, Johnson told her, quote, it looked like you liked it, end quote. But apparently it wasn't enough just to doubt her and humiliate her. They also expelled her from the school for sexual impropriety, for getting sexually assaulted. And that's the world we live in, folks. We live in a world that punishes the victims so that the next victim will know to keep their fucking mouth shut or open, depending on what the rapist is in the mood for, apparently. But it's no mystery how we got here or why we can't escape. It's not just that we have men in charge of everything, but an awful lot of them are misogynistic idiots, too. I mean, consider the story that comes to us from fellow podcaster Karen Aaliyah of Deconversion Therapy, a comedy podcast about religion. She wrote a guest post over at The Friendly Atheist that points to an upcoming lecture series that the Middleton, Tennessee Church of Christ is offering called The Christian Woman. Basically, it's a series of lectures on subjects like how to be a loving mother and how to be a faithful wife. Five lectures from five speakers on the issues facing women today. All five of them are men, even the one doing the speech called The Christian Woman's Response to the Feminist Movement. And it's not like these assholes are willing to confine their stupidity to church. Just look to Colorado where Corey Sulian, a pastor at the Hopewell Baptist Church, is running for Colorado State House under the women shouldn't wear pants platform. So basically, the instant this guy announced his candidacy, former congregants of his church started speaking up about his apparent long-standing obsession with the evils of lady pants. So much so that his campaign had to file a statement in which he totally doubled the fuck down. The statement reads in part, quote, Pastor Sulian has made it known that he believes that the Bible says it's immodest for women to wear pants, end quote. A statement that wasn't immediately followed by, which is why he's withdrawing from the race. Because legal weed or no, this is a state that once elected Gordon Klingenschmidt. And now that you're good and convinced that there is no hope like I am, I'll hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And in Meet My Brother Reza news tonight. <laughs> one of America's ma- oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, one of my uh, one of America's major political parties just noticed that atheists exist. Hi, uh, <laughs> hi, the Democratic Party. <laughs> so at I'd their like summer meeting this mom. past, <laughs> we're getting played off. All right, so at their summer meeting this past weekend, the Democratic National Committee voted unanimously to pass a resolution that recognized quote. The value, ethical soundness, and importance of the religiously unaffiliated demographic. End quote. And okay, <laughs> well, we're important. That's that's that we matter. Uh, but and according to the Secular Coalition for America, by the way, this is the first time a major U.S. political party has ever specifically courted religiously unaffiliated voters. You guys have a non-zero value and are not automatically evil. We have resolved. <laughs> I mean. 
It's really negging more than courting. Well, it's a like kind this. of courting, <laughs> which is sort of <laughs> technically courting too. Yeah. Our shirt hides our love handles nicely. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but we're really at a point where we're like, we're thankful to be negged. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You exist. Get excited. Who wants a Tim Ryan 2020 shirt? Get on out there. <laughs> they are absorbent. Those do not hide the love handles nicely. <laughs> nope. All right. So obviously resolutions like this don't tend to move the needle, but they are a good signal that the needle is moving. I, I mean, this is an election that's shaping up to be the most religiously partisan in the nation's history. And yes, I'm counting JFK's here. <laughs> JFK was Jewish? Uh, yeah, that's what the J stands for. <gasps> yep. I did not. Now I know that. Jewish Fitzgerald Kennedy. Yep. A lot of presidential candidates, of course, are already doing backbends to prove to Christians that they love Jesus, too. And, and, and by and large, atheists are just going to naturally vote for the party that isn't led by a guy who once promised to pass a law forcing businesses to say Merry Christmas. So it says a lot about where we are as a movement that the DNC feels comfortable wrapping their arms around us so publicly at this exact moment. Yeah, I mean, thanks for the kind of bullshitty nod, but yeah, thanks for something there. But, you know, maybe focus the fuck up. Head out to the Rust Belt. Let's <laughs> that would help. Like, that would help. That are going hey, you know to turn what? an election. You're going to lose no matter what. Run Marianne Williamson. We might as well have some fucking fun. That's no, all I'm not saying. Gonna fucking don't say that. Opposite all of right. what we just said. That was um, satire. Satire. That was the onion. <laughs> I'm sorry for trying to make it pleasant. <laughs> Trying for having some fun. Fun, now, fun. All right. So obviously Stroke. we're having fun <laughs> shit on this because it's like the only thing we've ever gotten and it's so little. But for what it's worth, this resolution is is worth a read. It makes some pretty solid points about why this is so long overdue. And they'll actually leave you feeling empowered as a non-religious voter. For example, quote, non-religious Americans make up 17 percent of the electorate as of 2018 or maybe, quote, the religiously unaffiliated demographic represents the largest religious group within the Democratic Party, end quote. So, you know, let's fucking act like it. Yeah. OK, so Vote. no writing yourself into an absentee ballot, which you forget to mail this year. OK, we're all <laughs> on the same side this time. <laughs> and in take the red pillow news. Phenomenal. Liberty University recently decided to grant an honorary degree to an important public figure for his contribution to academia, just like they do at the real university. <laughs> <laughs> During their mandatory attendance convocation last week, Liberty President Jerry Falwell Jr. presented an honorary doctorate to Mike Lindell, the CEO of My Pillow, the world's <laughs> Top-ranked retailer of Christian Bags of Soft. <laughs> and thanks to Lindell and his amazing contribution to humanity, he became an honorary doctor of letters? Letters! <laughs> Mostly Zs, I guess. I don't know. And Liberty University got to do a celebrity doctorate ceremony just like a big boy. Except instead of a... You know, Nobel laureate or something like that. It was the Ron Popeil of soft rectangles. <laughs> are, are we going to say soft, though? <laughs> For me, <laughs> softer. Okay, and you have to watch this bit. It's like kids playing honorary college degree. <laughs> I've, I've seen <laughs> invisible tea parties with more realism. <laughs> so, during the... Uh, pull-up diaper training of honorary degrees. <laughs> Dr. now Mike Lindell recounted his inspirational story of making the world a better place one $50 pillow at a time. <laughs> Jesus. And his dream of dominating the world of non-secular bags of foam started really taking shape back in 2016 when he met with Donald Trump at Trump Tower in New York City. Trump was in the final stretch of campaigning for president and arranged a meeting with this titan of the infomercial industry. Oh, uh, Jared Kushner would have been there, too, but he was meeting with a Russian guy about knockoff shamwows or something like that. Well, yeah, well, also, he didn't want a Jew there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so according to Dr. Mike, <laughs> quote, when I met with Donald Trump, it felt like a divine appointment, end quote. <laughs> 
Yes, go forth, my seraphim, and make sure that a game show host and Russian spy meets with a guy who lies about how comfortable memory foam is to old people. This is my will. <laughs> He's gotten weirdly specific in his old age, this guy. Yeah. Guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Dr. Foam Phil got his <laughs> fake degree and told the story about God anointing him the pillow messiah, the uh, a known adulterer, and then he went for the big reveal. This is so fun. He, he literally did, you know, the old, everyone please reach under your chairs. Well, sorry, un under your asses. We, we ran out of tape. It's kind of fucked up my big reveal. You get a <laughs> pillow. And you get a pillow. That's right. He gave out $600,000 worth of my pillows. And then, um, without any idea of the words he was saying, he told the mandatory audience of 12,000 creepy virgins, quote, <laughs> the pillow is just a platform for a much bigger thing. <laughs> your your hat? <laughs> uh, that was followed by the tacit segue, speaking of large asses, and he continued, my calling is to speak out the word of Jesus, okay. end quote. You make fun, but the crossover of people who need a special pillow to sit down and Christians is a circle in a circle, my friend. <laughs> it's a circle in a goddamn circle. <laughs> and then following the big ceremony, Jerry Falwell Jr. made a very excited post on Instagram with the caption, Mike gave each of the 12,000 students a my pillow. Retail value $600,000. <laughs> <laughs> what an amazing man who epitomizes the entrepreneurial principles that Liberty University was built upon. Uh, apparently, that's like part of their, I don't know, Liberty University, Luke's Veritas, call in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Prestigious university. Oh. Supplies are limited. <laughs> yes, they are. And in Oh Come All Ye Faithless news tonight, you know, here on The Scaling Atheist, there's a few things we'll never run out of. Noah's boundless rage, Heath's being smart and funny, and of course, okay, stories about fucking nativity displays. I feel like we could at least hope for a summer lull, couldn't mm -mm. we? Never stops, never slows down. <laughs> and perhaps over the last couple of years, there is no city that spent more time on our desk than Bethel, Connecticut. So... This all began in October of 2017, when city officials put a nativity scene outside of the municipality building. However, when a local atheist asked if he could put up a display, he was told that he had to fill out a formal application, something that was not required of local Christians. Ah, huh, different rights, <laughs> huh? He's like, all right, well, uh, someone's reading the phrase butt plug Jesus from official paperwork during a town meeting in Connecticut. So <laughs> that's all I know. You about made that. that happen. <laughs> yeah. Also, I uh, really didn't want to do this, but unleash the Blackwell. Yep, oh, exactly. Shit. So Jeff Blackwell from American Atheist sends a letter over saying no. And Bethel is like, sorry, sorry, our bad, our bad. Everyone has to fill out an application. But since there's not enough space for everybody, it's going to be a race. Oh, my gosh. Would you look at that? Christians won the race. Yeah. <laughs> Did you just tie the finish line to the back of their shoes? You just tied no. the finish line to the back of their shoes. <laughs> no. Yeah. So Jeff Started Blackwell there. walks over to his photocopier, scratches out the last date he wrote. <laughs> just the angriest, sweatiest photocopy you ever done seen. Sends the city the letter again saying... Still no. And Bethel's like, okay, got it, got it. Our bad. We'll do it by lottery, except for atheists who are guaranteed a space because you guys keep sending us letters. <laughs> right. Okay, Blackwell. So Muslim ban for the entire town. Got it. We understand. <laughs> Don't what let you're him saying. leave, even if you come to get him. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, I, I'm just imagining like Jeff in his office, bedraggled, his ties undone. He's got 15. <laughs> destroyed pop stress balls in a trash can next to his desk. He just writes a letter in crayon saying, no, the point is nobody gets special treatment. <laughs> Even us love Jeff. So just the one water fountain? I, I don't We're very confused, Jeff Blackwell. 
Okay, so uh, 17 letters later and 10 years of Jeff Blackwell's life later, this <laughs> week, finally, and at last, Bethel has announced that there will be a lottery for everybody who wants a space this holiday season. And listener, this gives you a distinct opportunity. <laughs> if you live in Bethel, Connecticut, or just represent a Satanist or an atheist group, Please, please, please fill out this lottery and put some giant dicks on the front lawn of this town's <laughs> municipality Make building. that butt plug Jesus happen. Do it. Do it for your fellow man, but mostly do it for the bleary-eyed, half-mad wretch of a man that was Jeff Blackwell. <laughs> Make it worth his while, people. <laughs> Where's Chaz Stevens? Shouldn't he be up in Bethel? And finally tonight, in Grifter News, and you can't tell, but I spelled that without an E, so it's clever. Yes. Pennsylvania Catholic <laughs> priest Joseph McClune didn't rape any kids. So that puts Good him in the start. top half of like, yeah, Good most start. ethical Catholic priest in Pennsylvania spreadsheet is uh, he's, he's rocking that. But he did steal almost $100,000 from the church and use it to pay men to fuck him, allegedly. OK, so that was stealing from a church and also consensual sex with a male adult prostitute. Um the end justifies the means, or or the means justify the end. I feel, it, it feels pretty ethical. All <laughs> yeah, right, yes, right. Thank you, Noah. We are strong supporters of both sex work and embezzlement on this show. Shame <laughs> on gay work. Shame on you, sir. <laughs> all right. So according to local Petty authorities, Bosnick's grandson, damn it. <laughs> over the past eight years, McClune, who looks like he just committed an atrocity over an improperly wrapped up extension cord, diverted about an eighth of a million dollars intended for the church into a private account. He then used said account to fund a lavish lifestyle that included a beach house, fine dining, and fucking a lot of dudes he made on Grindr. Uh, and by the way, just to demonstrate where we now are as a society, every single news article I saw about this guy felt the need to specify that his paid gay relationships were with, quote, adult men, end quote. Wow. Yeah, this guy should be running HR workshops at the Vatican. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> fantastic. Beach house, real. Fine dining, real. Fucking dudes, real. <laughs> Victimless crime. Yeah, right, right. The God this money yeah. was intended for. All right. Also, then. circling back, there's no atrocities. If you don't wrap an extension cord correctly, <laughs> whatever happens to you, you deserve Fair that. game. Fair game. I was going to say you look like Heath, but angry. But, you know, I figure I can. <laughs> sure. All right. So now some of you might be wondering how he could steal over 15 grand a year without anybody noticing for two goddamn presidential administrations. And that's because you're new to the show to atheism into America. Eli is the lovable rogue. I, I look sh shit like that tends to be treated <laughs> fucking easily when there's no governmental oversight of your charity. Churches don't have to say what they're doing with their money and what they're doing is so fucking heinous that they would rather fight to protect that privilege than not get ripped off for a hundred grand's worth of fucking rusty trombones now and again. And that by itself should be the only admission of guilt that we need. Yeah. Who knew those weird Always angry ladies across America who run our church treasuries weren't the best and the brightest. I didn't see it coming. <laughs> All right. Well, now that we finally caught a Catholic priest fucking an adult, I suppose we can close the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Tim Ryan 2020. Nope. Damn right. Nope. And when we come back, we'll see what it does to one's psyches when their porridge is always too cold. Once upon a time, a mama bear named Hillary Morgan Ferrer was reading some stupid and thought to herself, hey, I can make stupid. So she did, and she quickly rose to the top of her subcategory of a subcategory on Amazon. But then along came an English major that writes in phonetic hieroglyphs, and he said, look, even I can make fun of your writing, lady. And so he did. And now that you're all caught up on the action of Eli's ongoing book report on Ferrer's Mama Bear Apologetics, I suppose that we're ready to dive into Chapter 2. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, Chapter 1 was buy this book, so now now yeah. it's time mm -hmm. for <laughs> Chapter 2, <laughs> How to Be a Mama Bear. Is this code for being the weirdest mom on the playground? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, weird doesn't feel like the right descriptor there. Um, <laughs> like... Giving out craisins on Halloween, that's weird. That's weird. Yelling at your nine-year-old to make sure the culture doesn't distract them from God kind of puts you right there with anti-vax mom. <laughs> it's, it's weird how they kill people. No, it's not the right word. Weird is not a 
appropriate there. Yeah. And, and as if this book wasn't confusing as it is, uh, I should point out that this chapter is written by a different Hillary, Hillary Short. Either way, she's going to start this chapter off with the story of the time she and her husband went whitewater rafting with his family because... What this apologetics book was missing was slides from someone's vacation. Yeah, God. Okay, but if the turbulence of the river turns out to be an analogy for life, I fucking quit. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> a literal mama bear mauls her like a salmon. <laughs> okay, well, this is actually kind of funny. I'm writing a book. With <laughs> this. Okay, oh, but it's ironic. The story she uses at the beginning of this chapter here is amazing because it 1,000% does not prove what she think it no, does. No. Yeah. So in her story, her sister-in-law and her both get swept overboard in the side of the whitewater raft. And she talks about how her mother-in-law like leapt to the side of the boat and dragged her sister-in-law back on. And they're like, that's what a mama bear is. Smart and strong and quick to act and blah, 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 blah. But what she doesn't mention is Nobody pulled her out of the water. Yeah. <laughs> it's Sophie's <laughs> choice from Ava's perspective, and Miss Short doesn't know it. <laughs> yeah. Sophie's choice from God's perspective is having the Holocaust happen. Yeah. Just to be clear. <laughs> right. But um, here's the other thing I love it also proves, since, you know, she didn't die before she wrote this, that it was unnecessary, right? Like she was fine. Her sister in law could have just swam back over to the boat. So even in her own fucking story, the mama bear is irrational, overprotective, and doesn't improve the situation. <laughs> yeah. Um, so she, she talks about how hard it is to be a mom for a little bit, and now it is time for her to shit on Camp Quest. Literally. The, like, creative camp for skeptical kids. She yeah. actually names Camp Quest, and the example she uses is the invisible unicorn test they talk about with the kids. Now, for, for those of you who don't know, this is a fun little exercise they do with the kids at Camp Quest where they tell the kids, hey, there's an invisible unicorn somewhere at camp, but it can't be seen or smelled or touched, and we only know it exists because of a thousands of years old book. And then the counselors sort of talk the kids through how we would disprove that unicorn. Yeah, and, and by the way, regardless of what Camp Quest's restraining order says, Eli, I think using that to convince the kids you weren't masturbating was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Stupid, itchy ankle bracelet. Anyways, the invisible unicorn, it's a fun sort of lighthearted way to talk to kids about critical thinking. Unless you're Hillary Short, in which case your response in this chapter is, you motherfuckers don't even want to find the unicorn because you love being <laughs> gay so much. <laughs> I'm hetero fucking this unicorn right now. We're going to have a unicorn baby and... Nail it to a cross. Learn some morality. <laughs> Here's her literal response. Quote, this belief is known as scientism. No. And it's flavor of naturalism, which we will discuss in chapter six. I ask you, dear reader, is that very belief able to be seen, heard, tasted, smelled or touched? Why do you want to lick everybody's brain, Hillary? Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. And that, by the way, is the end of the section. She doesn't, like, go further. She's just like, <laughs> fuck you, Bertrand Russell. You can't smell your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Smells like victory, just for the record. <laughs> so now we're on a section titled, Apollo what? What are we apologizing for? I do, the, the kid rape, maybe? Uh, genocide. Roads, the aqueduct. You really want to play this game? Okay. Yeah, because this section should very well be called most of the people who read this book literally only know one definition of the word apologetic at most. <laughs> Whenever I say Christians need to learn apologetics, people throw sandals at me and yell, I ain't apologize for shit. Is the subtitle of this chapter about <laughs> Yes, this? yes. Yep. Right, so I, I totally knew this. Just want to throw this out there because I'm super smart. But apologetics, the word, comes from the Greek apologia, which referred to how a lawyer would argue their case. So I'm just saying, now we can't say that Hillary Short didn't teach us anything. I mean, we, we can definitely say that. Well, we can say, I mean, it means speaking in defense. Anyways, moving on. Now we're at a section called <laughs> A Call for Moms. And this section is... Another goddamn ad for Mama Bear Apologetics, the website. We are two chapters into this book. And so far, the intro and both chapters have been ad for this book and related products. 
Yeah. Uh, well, oh, but also, though, we learned from Lee Strobel that when your readers are Christian, you got to constantly give the next page the hard sell, though. But this book gets even better if you read a chapter three, guys. Yep. Just reading this page on my Casper mattress <laughs> sure is comfy. Yeah. So she has the saddest plug ever for her podcast here. I want to read it. So this is a real quote, quote. The Mama Bear Apologetics podcast is a conversational style podcast where she and a partner discuss various apologetics topics. I don't know about you, but I can't follow a university lecture while I'm driving or packing lunches. But I, like most women, what? possess the ability to follow Wait. a conversation no matter what else what? I'm doing. End quote. Yeah, just just someone else chew my gum for me for a minute. <laughs> what the fuck? My lady brain can't handle the complexity of the <laughs> monologue format as complicated. Seriously? They're, they're, they need to have a little sexism in there, too? And and then she actually says packing lunches, like, uses up all her intellectual RAM? Yes, and yeah, right. She put that in her book. Yep. <laughs> what the fuck is it? Like, she's listening to a lecture on apologetics, just like, so God works in mysterious peanut butter jelly bread. <laughs> peanut butter. Oh, I lost track again. Mysterious what? Mysterious what? What was he going to say? God works in mysterious peanut butter? Peanut God butter. Damn. That uh. doesn't make sense. So now it's time for what a mama bear is and isn't. Are you guys ready? Because these section headings literally never mean what you think they I mean. I feel like I can right. name a lot of isn't. That's just like an easy category. Yep. I feel like she's just setting herself up to have some All easy right. ones. So uh, first up. A mama bear is not necessarily a mom. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. okay. Go on. Uh, and Scientist. if you thought this section was going to be, you know, gender inclusive, uh, you're new here. Welcome <laughs> to the podcast. <laughs> Lovable rogue. No, what she means by this section is that you can yell this shit at other people's kids. <laughs> and the proof <laughs> is the most horrifying twist since old boy is Hillary Morgan Ferrer. That's right. Fucked her the daughter. collector of this book, HMO, wrote a book about defending your kids from the satanic influence of reason, and she does not have kids, which makes this book eight million times creepier. Wow. wow. That this really does. It's terrifying. Okay. Uh, so next up, a mama bear isn't necessarily formally educated in apologetics. You know, because that's not what those words mean. <laughs> yeah. No, I feel like necessarily formally in and apologetics are all just there to pad the word count all superfluous <laughs> yeah. all right our next one is a mama bear is not abrasive or argumentative i do not believe you yep <laughs> that lying. whole little this mini section comes up way more protesting too much than it does as advice <laughs> yeah no this it's, this chapter isn't mad it's disappointed gotcha yeah. <laughs> uh then we get a mama bear isn't one stereotype not a great sign when your list of shared characteristics include they don't have shared characteristics. Yes. <laughs> Sine pas and mama bear. Yeah. <laughs> In this section, she points out that mama bears can be anything. They can be mothers and yoga instructors and CEOs. And my reaction was, yeah, but they're they're not CEOs, <laughs> are they? <laughs> Hillary Shard, they're not, though. You can just be, be a CEO of stuff if you want, by the way. Just like, hey, I just became a CEO of like six things there you just go. now. Look at me go. Ryan Slotnick, he was from some Mars. <laughs> All right. So now that we know what mama bears aren't, besides actual fucking mamas. <laughs> or bears. This is the yeah. <laughs> Holy Roman Empire of apologetics. Here. Or pipes. <laughs> yeah. They're not. It's time to learn the four key traits of mama bears, or as Hillary calls them, the four H's. All right, do they so all start with H? At this? They do. Yeah. Wow. Okay. She nails it. I, she does nail it. I was... 50-50. Oh, you would not have been wrong if you if she had gotten one that one was of like a silent. W. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Arithmetic in there somewhere. <laughs> Pull. Yeah. Number one, honesty. Liar. Yep. Yeah, okay, just going to start this liar clock. Let's see how that <laughs> right. So she goes. sets up the Bones of Christ challenge here, right? Like, But then she doesn't answer it. She literally, in this chapter section, is just like, what if someone showed you the Bones of Christ and proved that he never rose from the dead? Um... We are basically scientists. She and doesn't <laughs> stop in the clock. That's it. So, was that eight, nine seconds? Yep, she cool. did it. She did it. Number two, the H number two, humility. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Be sure to dedicate a few paragraphs to how humble we are in this. Okay. Just going to start this pride clock and stop it again. Yep. Yeah, I really didn't need to start <laughs> that one zero. at all. 
And that's a double click. And all I want to add is that she wraps up her humility section about how humble Christians are by saying, quote, above all, the mama bear recognizes the dignity in the questioner behind the question because she loves others as God's creatures. And as a fellow passenger on this ball we call home that hurdles through space at 67,000 miles per hour. You don't get to know the quote. speed of the earth. Fuck you. And it, it's just worth noting, like, she probably lost some readers for saying that it's a ball <laughs> that spins at 67. Like, let's not forget that mama bears just recently, your side accepted the fucking round earth model. So yeah, like, don't and use not it all the way. Yeah. Not universally or anything. <laughs> H number three, humor. <laughs> oh, will any of these not be self-contradictory? <laughs> No. Okay, but in fairness, I laughed when I saw that number three was humor. Yeah, well, there's a, no, that's I, I true. Laughed. That's true. When I first saw that, that was quite humorous to me. Oh, and this this section, it oh, it's pain. It's a, humor is great. I mean, I'm a Christian woman writing in an apologetics book, so <laughs> my understanding of humor is what comes between live and love on a wooden board <laughs> I keep in the kitchen. But go ahead and chuck some jokes in there if you want. Cool, yeah. Maybe we can get Hillary to do some of her uh, awesome jokes on the show. Two votes. <laughs> get on the show and votes. tell some of her jokes. Please. She's I'll got bits. 15 minutes of airtime. She does characters. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she does impressions. I bet she does impressions. Oh. Carl Black gets into people. a fight with a okay. Christian pug. <laughs> All right. And finally, number four of our H's in the spirit of humility, which was number two, just quick reminder, <laughs> heroism. <laughs> <laughs> and again, this section is is just like, if you think about it, being an asshole about Jesus to people way too young to defend themselves really is like being Superman. Yep. I just want to cover one little quote. She says, quote, what worked for our generation growing up, attending church, Awana, and reading the Bible is no longer sufficient. Are we saying that scripture is insufficient? Absolutely not. <laughs> no, Stop I, hitting yourself. No, I'm, <laughs> saying, I'm saying that we are useless. Us. <laughs> I'm saying it's important to be humble, and I'm also saying the Bible is incomplete without your copy of Mama Bear Apologetics. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yes, I am. <laughs> $9.99. All right, so now it's time for a section. She is called, I'm new to apologetics. Where do I even start? I bet the answer is this fucking book, isn't it? One of them. <laughs> one of them. Uh, so number one is know your Bible. Yeah, that's how you know where to find your Achilles heel and Achilles anatomy chart. Yep. All <laughs> it's other all parts of the body. That's what we're using. So uh, number two, gather resources. And Noah, you guessed it. This section is once again, buy this book and listen to our fucking podcast. <laughs> uh, number three, carve out regular family time to study, which feels like cheating to me. Is that I not just, cheating? Uh, again, what does it say about your readership when you feel the need to spell out that this will all take place in the time dimension and therefore will require a blocked out <laughs> segment thereof? But if you're studying the Bible and, you know, you keep mixing up the order of peanut butter and jelly, don't worry. <laughs> That's just normal lady brain happens standard. So just check out Bible Peace Theater. You can hear the book in a nice, digestible conversation form yeah. that us lady people <laughs> so can follow. Go. We got Public songs. Service. That's great. Number four, find like-minded mamas. And in case you're wondering, yes, this entire section is block your shitty atheist niece on Facebook and her dumb questions. Minion memes should be the only thing on your timeline. <laughs> yeah, right. No, if you want to learn how to argue your side of the debate, be sure to team up with people that don't disagree with you. <laughs> Ever. Yeah. Great place to start. Uh, just walk out front of a Walmart and yell, I'm looking for answers. You will find a mama bear who is happy to help you <laughs> right away. <laughs> and uh, number five. Practice, practice, practice. Now, now look, Tim's going to put this on YouTube. There's going to be a hashtag. Mama Bears, if you're listening, and I really, really hope you are, if you ever want to practice, give us here at The Scathing Atheist a call. One out of three of us promises to be nice. He really does. <laughs> but, but he's lying. He <laughs> is. He's going to ask you how your hospital tour is going and make you cry. But he, he is humorous and a hero. <laughs> <laughs> And that. What, what was the other one? Humble. There you go. There you go. 
All right. So with that fun out of the way, it's time for some discussion questions. No. You guys oh, ready good. for the discussion yeah. questions? Oh, yeah. All right. Number one's an icebreaker, as usual. Uh, <laughs> what have you witnessed, either in yourself or someone else, that demonstrates the strength and ferocity of a mama bear protecting her kids? Okay. Um, in 2003, Deanna Laney killed two of her sons by crushing their heads with rocks so they wouldn't have to suffer during the end times. Does that count? Is that what you're promoting, lady? <laughs> the heavy rock. <laughs> Did she spare a few of her sons? But she, no, no. she tried to kill the third one and the third one survived just with terrible fractures to a skull. Mysterious ways. <laughs> Mysterious mama bears. Okay. Um, let's see. Something that demonstrates, what was it? The strength and ferocity of a mama bear. Mm -hmm. Protecting her kids. I, I would say this book, but Hillary Morgan Ferrer isn't being fruitful and multiplying because she's a bad Christian and a broken woman. So oh, God. Uh, pass. I'm going to pass. Yeah, you I'm, pass. I'm not answering these questions. Andrew deleted my answer from the notes because it's the condition of the lawsuit. So okay, whatever. Yeah. We'll move on. Uh, <laughs> question number two, main theme. You can do this. What are some misconceptions what? you have had about apologetics in the past? Did this chapter help clarify how you as a mom can be a Christian apologist? What stood out to you? The fact that you already took away the you don't have to be a mom clause. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, time for some self-evaluation. All right, we're going deep. Review the so four H attributes. Which characteristic comes most easily to you? Which is the hardest and why? Just to review, the four H's were honest, humble, hero humor. Which is the title of our Christian stand-up comedy yes, tour, by the way. Yes, it is. <laughs> back into back in across the mega churches <laughs> of the country. All right, number four, it's time for a brainstorm. What are some ways you and other moms can encourage and reinforce learning apologetics for each other and in your church community? Oh, good one. Uh, recruit better authors. <laughs> yeah, uh, for the Bible. Get a better God. <laughs> better ghostwriter. All right, and then four, finally, release the bear. Okay, please be literal. <laughs> exactly Someone not. make please fun of you for being bald? <laughs> tell me yeah. she involves a bear. <laughs> Would you be willing to talk to your pastor or other church leaders about their thoughts on apologetics and the importance of worldview training aimed at helping youth? What are some ways we could help the church reverse this trend of young people leaving? <laughs> stop raping them stop raping them stop that raping would help them. so much don't don't, don't release questions. bears when they make fun of you for being bald perhaps don't want the answer <laughs> or celebrate books that recommend that anyway all right well we're not going to ask poor eli to read more than one chapter of this thing at a time so we're going to close it out there but we'll be back in a few weeks with even more ad copy in the next god awful books Before we reach the caboose tonight, I wanted to wish a happy belated birthday to our friend and colleague, Heath Enright. He recorded today's episode with us on the day after his birthday, and he spent the whole day on his birthday writing headlines and shit for you. Least you could do is send him some birthday wishes once the episode's over. I, I should also remind you, by the way, that he's going to be speaking at the Kentucky Free Thought Convention on September 21st in Lexington. So if you're going to be anywhere near that, be sure to check out the show notes and follow the link to get your tickets. That would be a way better way to wish him a happy birthday. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you tonight. But we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptic Ride, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Monday. An even newer episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. And an even newer episode of our half sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern. Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd be deprived of a wish or something if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for making yet another successful solar lap. I need to thank Eli Bosnick for eventually agreeing that the severed heads of his enemies would not be an appropriate gift, even if it was accompanied by a singing telegram. I need to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Delusions for making my world go around. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most omnificent omnivores, Ashlyn, Richard, Jason, Amber, Michael, Robert, Joshua, Daniel, Jeff, Sarah, James, and Leanne. Ashlyn, Richard, Jason, and Amber, who are so bright you need sunglasses to look at them. Michael, Robert, Joshua, Daniel, whose erections are pictured at the right side of the Mohs scale. And Jeff, Sarah, James, and Leanne, whose IQs are higher than I have to be to make it through GAM movies. Together, this dozen denizens of disbelief delighted our debtors and delayed our descent into dejection this week by dealing us dollars. Not everybody has the dollars it takes to give some of them to us, but if you think you're up to the challenge, you can make a per-episode donation to patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby 
audio and early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingads.com. And if you'd like to help, but not in a dollar giving way, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review on iTunes, telling a friend about the show, and following at PIAT Pod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark. We also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com. Oh, Jogan. Sorry. He's going to die. It was a very small sip of coffee left. Do you want some of my water or do you want to die? I'm good. I got it. He's going to die. I'm going to make it. All right. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved.